a long discussion now we'll discuss about the techniques as most of the part of mine is also covered by uh, my previous presenters so we'll just go through this so first of all we'll uh, see about the background how the examination is done in the background so it should be a semi dark room uh, in the semi dark room it helps to improve the contrast and also allows the lower in intensity of the light uh, to be used by the entire room. the room should be uh, sufficiently large so that we can uh, the examiner can move around and uh, in the examination uh, about now the about the the patient should be in the supine or it can be in the supine uh, bed or, or a reclining chair the height of the couch should be about the waist of the, till the examiner the patient neck should be neither be too flexed nor extended the examine uh, should be an obstructed movement uh, of the head so it should be a the room should be quite educated and the pupil should be well dilated so about the examination technique first of all the crowning it has been already we told how to adjust the uh, ideo and it should be the proper adjustment otherwise uh, for seeing a lot of patient a headache can occur so uh, most of uh, uh, first the adjustment of the height should be there the adjustment of the width should be there and the adjustment of placement of whole unit should be there uh, we'll first of all switch, uh, switch on the indirect and the, then the keep the illumination to the half of the maximum adjusting the uh, adjustable hand if needed is uh, very important the ocular should be perpendicular to the pupillary axis and as close as to the pupil as possible then uh, closer the eye piece in the eye the larger the field of view and more satisfactory is the manipulation of the instrument now uh, adjusting the eye piece in the inter uh, pupillary distance we have first of all we have to close one eye and adjust the ocular uh, in front of the other eye with the horizontal sliding movement in such a way that the light source is in the center of the square of the ocular repeat the same maneuver from the other eye also the vertical alignment can be adjusted by up and down movement of the mirror while focusing, focusing the arm uh, with distance then open both the eyes and check for the binocular single vision at the arm with distance and we have to see it to prevent the diplopia and provides best stereopsis we have to uh, see then holding the lens it has been already told by uh, rushali then now how to uh, hold the 20d lens first of all it is hold by the tip of uh, of the flex index finger finger and the ball of the extended thumb the wrist should be uh, mildly flexed uh, moderately flexed and the third fourth and the fifth fingers are extended the third finger can be used to retract the lid and the fourth and fifth finger can uh, we can put it on the head or to place at rest or we can use both the hands also to uh, retract the lid then first the first of all uh, the illumination uh, illuminate the patient pupil area by pointing the illumination towards the patient eye approximately for 10 seconds which will help by uh, for the light adaptation then uh, then use the uh, indirect lens for uh, about you place it about 2 cm and then center the lens on the pupil then the uh, pull back the lens away from the patient eye at the same timing taking care to keep the illumination centered to the pupil while withdrawing the lens the practitioner will find a distance that provides an optimum field of view this should uh, be approximately at the focus of the lens so uh, the viewing the retina uh, the light source the condensing lens in the patient eye should be in one line of the axis so that we can see in the uh, in this picture that the retina is viewed by doing so the optimum light enters to the patient eye and the whole condensing lens is filled of the view of the retina so now how to examine the peripheral funda should be examined first in order to allow the practitioner to adapt to the light the patient is asked to move the eye into the optimal position for the examination example if he is looking away from the examiner to facilitate the examination of the peripheral retina while scanning different areas movement of the head and the rest of the body should be in unif in the uniform without any movement of the neck so as to maintain a uniform axis between the light source condensing lens and the patient pupil the movement should be smooth continuous so that this any skip area won't be there the examiner move around the head of the patient to examine the different coordinates of the fundus 
For example, to examine the inferior quadrant, the patient is asked uh, uh, to look uh, up, uh, sorry, uh, to examine the inferior quadrant at around six o'clock. The examiner should stand uh, uh, towards the patient head at 12 o'clock position and so on. So when looking to the peripheral retina, hence uh, through an oblique pupil, it will be helpful to align the head with the long axis of the oblique pupil. Remember, whatever direction the patient is looking that, the part of the retina you are viewing. When examining the superior fundus, the patient should, be ele uh, should elevate above the examiner, allowing the maximum superior view. And for the nasal, temporal, and the retina directly above and below the posterior pole are examined with the patient at the examine's eye level. When examining the inferior fundi, the patient should be lowered the examiner standing. The posterior pole of the, and the optic nerve are examined at the last. By asking the patient to look in the extreme gaze using a scleral indicator, the whole peripheral retina up to the aura can be examined. So now the scleral indentation. Uh, the purpose is to enhance the recognition of the peripheral degeneration, to enhance the recognition of the retinal beaks, to e evaluate the presence uh, and the amount of vitreous traction surrounding the retina breaks or degeneration lesion. So there are different type of scleral indenters used, and uh, they are shocked uh, double argas, O'Connor indenter. These are used uh, in uh, here. And we have various type of uh, indenter that is from the right to left end. Uh, and the other is, uh, the, at the side there is a Spedis uh, uh, pediatric indenter which is used for the pediatric. Uh, we usually in our OPD use this type of indenters. <coughs> so uh, for the indentation, the indenter is placed on the superior palpable lid crease initially. And then the, as the patient is asked to look superiorly, the indenter is placed pal, uh, parallel to the globe, deeper into the orbit. And finally, the condensing lens is brought into the path of the light source. The light source, ocular, and the condensing lens pupil and uh, indented area should be in one line for the maximum view. And for, look, uh, for the looking the indentation, uh, look in the lower field of the lens as uh, it will be inverted and keep the dip uh, depressor moving slightly to aid finding the indented retina. Move around the patient to cover all the ang angles approximately 45 degree for each setting and placing a probe 180 degree to the point of observation. Each circumferential placement of the indenter allow the examine to, uh, uh, examination of one and a half clock hours of the retina. Avoid indenting the tarsal plate. Avoid indenting too close to the limbus. It, it can cause pain. And if the patient is experiencing uh, too much of pain, that means you are applying a too much pressure. It is too tangential or too anteriorly. Uh, so uh, in not, the indentation uh, should not be done in a case of when there is a recent history of intraocular surgery. Uh, and if the patient have any open wound injury or open globe. Thank you. Now I invite Dr. Ian Mann. 